of times there's two backs back there. There's one guy you want to get the ball. Why are you handing off to Abdul Jabbar with 2.2 yards a carry? And there's one guy you don't want to get the ball. Anything but that. Anything but that. But those guys, you didn't want either one of them to get the ball. Tandems are great. We agree. Everyone loves a great tandem. Direct from New York come the famous Peppermint Lounge Twisters. That's a pretty dynamic combination right there. But when compiling our list, we had to draw the line at complicated couples and broadcast booth legends. I have goosebumps all over. With apologies to Bill and Monica. That's a tandem. This list is limited to the backfield. We're the best back in the league. What defines a great backfield tandem? The two players complement each other. Complement each other. Complement each other very well. I can work with this guy. When one goes down, the other one fills in. If I'm not high, he is. When I think of a backfield tandem, I think of running backs playing together. One gets the ball this play, the other gets the ball the next play. They each block for each other. Our countdown combines talent and teamwork. We love each other. And while we couldn't include sweetness and the bridge, the legend <laughs> continues. It's unfortunate to some degree that we don't have the appreciation. Our final tally will offer some surprises. I think everybody was surprised except for Bill Walsh. The number 10 backfield tandem of all time, Ernest Viner and Kevin Mack. Number 10? God, you guys are mean. Those guys are something else. A blue-collar backfield invaded Cleveland in the mid-80s. The Viner mack combination was the classic lunch pail combo. These are two very strong backs that cause people to miss. Look out! Not only were they did they work well together, but they're they, they're punishing. Mac and Biner, two north south runners. All right. Oh, the Man, they were big. They're really big in tech mobile. I don't remember Kevin Mack that much as the player. I remember him as the video game uh, pixelated version on tech mobile. <laughs> I remember if the real life version of Kevin Mack was even nearly that good. Kevin Mack was a guy who had not only speed, 51 yards on a bolt of lightning, but he had the power to really embarrass you. Right at the four yard line, he's hit, and he just continues to keep driving, running over a whole bunch of oil. You could find highlights of Mack where he resembled in a frame of Jim Brown. Vince Newsom is flat on his stomach, lights out. He was the one guy I was scared to hit. Kevin Mack rolling with all 18 wheels. For Rookie of the Year Mack, nothing could be finer than to team with Ernest Biner in the backfield. Ernest Biner, he had the kind of shake. With one move, he could embarrass you in a quite different way. It gave you so many options to have a guy in there who could run the ball, catch the ball. Oh, great hands. And then block defensive linemen. He's the heart of that Cleveland offense behind Kozar. They were the right kind of guys for that Cleveland Browns team in that town. In 1985, Biner and Mack became the third running back tandem in NFL history to each run for 1,000 yards. It was Mack and Biner, Biner and Mack. Which one was going to get it? And where was he going to go? That is Kevin Mack. That's Biner. That team uh, was a transition team. Marty Schottenheimer took over and, and, and made it a ground team to try to win. We'll do it our way, one at a time. Let's go. They remain one of only four running back tandems to achieve the 1,000-yard plateau in a season. See, so why aren't they, like, number four? At least number four. Yeah, if there's only three others. So why are they stuck at number 10 on our list? Two words, the fumble. Draw to Biner. Ernest Biner. Bumble. Bumble the ball, and Denver has recovered. Oh, my. Unfortunately for Ernest Biner, that the ball came out. And how 
unkind it is for the fans of Cleveland again. If they would have won that Lombardi Trophy, Smokes definitely would have heard more about that tandem. Doesn't seem fair. Make them number, number four. Who do I talk to about that? What does a precision passing game have to do with our countdown? Stay tuned to find out. They opened up new ways to show how you could play running back in the NFL. Certain tandems that fail to make our list are still in a league of their own. Together, Marion Motley and Edgar Jones won four All-America Football Conference Championships for the Browns, but never played together in the NFL. Herschel Walker left a starring role in the USFL to share screen time with Tony Dorsett and Big D. However, the Dallas duet went solo after only two seasons. I ain't never seen nothing like this. Bo Jackson made a name in Major League Baseball before he teamed with Marcus Allen, giving the Raiders a big league backfield, but they were seldom seen on the field together. Bangs through Bosworth! Touchdown, Raiders! None of these tandems could guarantee results like the AFL pair next on our list. Number nine backfield tandem of all time. Emerson Boozer and Matt Snell. When I think of Snell and Boozer, I think you're talking about complete backs, but very different backs. Both are fine runners and good receivers, and together they give the Jets as fine a pair of setbacks as there is in the NFL. Emerson Boozer was the one, early in his career, he was being compared to Gale Sayers. And just look at the drive, balance, and speed that Boozer's got. It had this great runner in Boo. And you had this sort of classic 235-pound fullback in Matt Snell. Matt Snell carried the brunt of the Jets' running attack. And like Boozer, he is the most versatile setback. Matt was pure power. Big enough to hurt when he hit. <laughs> Yet he had the speed to turn it on. Fast enough to break away for long game. Snell was great. Boozer was an underrated player. They complemented each other very, very well. They deserve to be on your list. Our number nine backfield tandem hit the stage in 1966, but job number one on the Jets was being bodyguards for Broadway Joe. If you played with Namath, you had a block. Everybody had a block. Namath has long played with protection, the best any quarterback could hope for. But blocking didn't come easy to Emerson Boozer. He tried. He, he tried to block. He just didn't have technique. Needless to say, this is not recommended. By rookie year, I missed a block. Nelson's says, we get that rookie out of here. He's going to get me killed. <laughs> I felt this small. But what he did is say, hey, you better learn to block. This year, Boozer scored less, but developed his blocking and receiving to become a complete runner. He redefined himself. He became a terrific blocker, which added to Matt Snell's ability to run the ball as effectively as he did. Matt Snell led the team in rushing with over 700 yards. By 1968, our number nine backfield tandem was at the top of their game as Snell and Boozer helped bulldoze the Jets all the way to Super Bowl three. And Snell has been the outstanding runner so far. He's in there. Everyone zeroed in on Namath so much that they forgot to see in that game that Snell had a very good game running the football. What a game Snell is at. Running left, running right. I mean, look, he should have been the MVP of Super Bowl three. I don't think there's any doubt about it. You know, scored the only touchdown, 121 yards rushing in that game. And the rushing yards was set up by, by Emerson Boozer's blocking. Speaking of blocking, Boozer makes the key one on this running play. When you think of the Jets and you think of that great season, that Super Bowl year. The New York Jets are the world champions. They needed that running game, and those two guys were just quiet, steady workers. The number eight backfield tandem of all time, Roger Craig and Tom Rathman. The Craig-Rathman combo was truly, I think, one of exceptional athletic ability in Craig. A discouraging run for the defense by Roger Craig. And Rathman's just tough, hard-hitting style. Rathman just dragging tacklers again. Square-hitted fullback, high-kneed halfback. Roger Craig plays football the way it's supposed to be played. There was a Nebraska Cornhusker backfield come to San Francisco. They're going to name a city after him in the state of Nebraska. They were perfect in the way that they had different personalities and different styles suiting each other. Craig behind Rathman. 
Rathman was, of course, the, the lunch pail go to work guy every day. No excuses today. Everybody's got to sell out. He walked in the door the first time and he had that. You know, Nebraska Midwest crew cut square head. And you looked at him and went, now that's a fullback. Craig was the stallion. Did anybody want to take on those knees? He was busting people. He delivered absolute bowling ball touchdown runs, knocking over pins of defenders. A handoff to Craig over left tackle. Sweeps outside. He goes to the end zone. Touchdown 49ers. They were at the forefront of Bill Walsh's offense. The 49ers of the 80s were defined by their innovative passing game. The 49ers have brought the quality of football to really a new level. It was the role that our number eight tandem played within the offense that made the 49ers cutting edge. You had this bruising fullback coming out of the field, flattening people, really sound fundamental football player. Now Tom Rathman starts catching passes. He's got Rathman. He's into the end zone. In 1989, Tom Rathman caught more passes than any other running back in the NFC. Catching the football, not necessarily a requirement of Nebraska as a fullback. Can you believe it? I can't. If Rathman was a boy wonder among fullbacks, then Craig was a man of steel among halfbacks. I think Roger was most, one of the most versatile runners ever. Five years he led the team in rushing. It's a draw up the middle to Craig, and he breaks loose and runs loose. He gets used to the 30 to the 25. He's down to the 20. Breaks loose again. He's in the 10. Five. Touchdown, 49ers. Four years he led the team in receiving. Just a tremendous individual effort to pull out with him. We know that this guy will have to cover Roger, which is scary for them. We weren't used to seeing fullbacks and, and tailbacks together catch the ball. you got any, any questions about this, just hit one of these two backs along the sideline. They are habitually underrated. I'm beginning to think we should give Nebraska a little more credit than we're yeah. giving them up here. Well, I think we should be in the top three at least. We won game. We went back to back together, which is incredible. The 49ers become the first team to win back to back Super Bowls since the Pittsburgh Steelers. Seeing those guys win a couple of Super Bowls, I would think would get them a little higher on the list. Up next. This wind is stronger than we've ever had. I hate rain, though. I'm about to snow than rain. No. How did Mother Nature make her way into one of our backfield tandems? They were the ultimate thunder and lightning. Lightning and thunder right back again. And the combination of the two was unlike anything else in the league at that time. When we looked into some of the great backfield tandems of late, we found that something funky is going on in Florida. That's uh, interesting. I don't know that there's anything in the water down here. Take Tampa Bay's duo of Warwick Dunn and number 40, Mike Alston. WD-40 was a good combination. They were wonderful for us, because that's all we had. Touchdown, Fred Taylor! Up north, Jacksonville's ground game got a jolt when Fred Taylor forced a friendship with Maurice Jones-Drew. That's a pretty good move. Yeah, I like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice Jones-Drew, touchdown, Jacksonville! And how about the Wizards of the Wildcat down in Miami? Yeah! Oh, the Patriots have no idea what hit them. Ronnie Brown and Ricky Williams' revival of the Dolphins' running attack reminds us of the Sunshine State twosome next on our list. The number seven backfield tandem of all time. Larry Zonka and Mercury Morris. Larry Zonka, Mercury Larry Zonka and Mercury Morris. This was not just a typical one-two punch tandem. This was a jab, 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 and then a huge uppercut from Zonka. Touchdown, Larry Zonka! Zonk was the power running back. Merck was the quick outside running dash to the goal line tailback. Led by Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka, the Miami machine continued to move goalward. There you had the classic thunder and lightning. Because Morris was quick and fast, and Zonka, no one wanted to tackle him. Guys came with me on a fake. They know I didn't have the ball, but they didn't want to have to tackle Zonka. The Dolphins were determined to send Zonka and Morris on the same successful journeys they have taken all year. But let's not let's not let's not overlook uh, uh, Jimmy Kick. Miami's offense is based on their two fine runners, Larry Zonka and number 21 Jim Kick. When I came there in 69 to the Dolphins, Jim Kick 
was the star of that football team. Hands off, kick through the middle, he's got a touchdown! In fact, there was a famous uh, poster from the era where, where they were dressed as Butch Cassidy and the, the Sundance Kid. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are alive and prospering. I was closer to Jim because we had been together longer and we were roommates and all the things that go into that. Jim Kick was a spectacular player. You can imagine Coach Shula's dilemma at that time. The touchdown was Morris's fifth in the last two games, and he has broken up the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid tandem. I started to realize the great ability of a Mercury Morris. He could break tackles, but he also was very elusive. Mercury put on a great show as Morris rolled relentlessly downfield. And Zaka was the big, powerful guy that always got you the touchdown. Kick was a guy on third down that could get open and catch the football. Instead of uh, Zaka and Mercury, I like to talk Zaka, Kick, and Mercury because that was the best backfield in the National Football League. With Jim Kick kicking in as a complimentary back, our number seven backfield tandem terrorized defenses with a simple formula. We are going to pound your ass. And it was the perfect balance and counterbalance. You'd go Zonka, Zonka, Zonka inside, and here you pitch the ball to Mercury and Morris, and he could fly. He is blessed with blazing speed that makes him a threat each time he touches the ball. When people started to overreact to that, we slammed them in the middle. This is what makes the partnership so successful. Defenses, I don't think at that time, could cope with the dramatic difference between their styles. A jitterbug named Morris and a bulldozer named Zonka. In 1972, Zonka and Morris made history as the first ever pair of runners to rush for a thousand yards each while also powering the Dolphins to a perfect season. That's the ball game. Miami has won Super Bowl seven. He and I were the quintessential concept of speed and power. Whether it was power running game, whether it was wide sweeps, whatever it was, you really established dominance through running the ball, and that's what we did. The number six backfield tandem of all time. Keith Lincoln and Paul Lowe. Keith Lincoln and Paul Lowe absolutely belong on the list. No club in the AFL's early years could equal the talent of the Chargers, who won five division titles in their first six seasons. In the early 1960s, the AFL was trying to find its footing, and no one had better traction than our number six tandem. They were phenomenal. Lincoln ran crowd pleasers like this one all year long. Paul Lowe takes a pitch out, and he's off and running. These two guys just played off each other absolutely beautifully. Keith Lincoln, as a fullback, was an effective runner, very fast for a fullback. And Keith rips up the middle for 40 yards. You don't want to get down there around his tires, because he'll run you over. He was the AFL equivalent of Paul Horning. He could do it all. Who could run between the tackles, also could break a tackle and get outside, and was a terrific receiver out of the backfield. Brings one to Keith Lincoln. The former Washington Stater drives 15 yards before being stopped. He threw halfback options. He threw six touchdowns in his career. It'll fix it for Keith Lincoln on the run pass. Lincoln spots an all alone Lance Allworth and Whammo. And he bends Cannon to Luke Lincoln as he comes off the field. Paul uh, was much smarter than I. He'd say, well, let Lincoln block for me and I'll carry the ball. Lowe, trying to skirt Andrew's hit, breaks away. Lincoln gives him a block. And the play is good for 25 yards. The place I should love to run would be sweeps because once I got outside, I don't think anybody could catch me. Here's Lowe in high gear again. Yes, in high gear to another touchdown. Their real pinnacle was 1963. They played in the championship game. They played against the Boston Patriots, who were the number one defensive team in the AFL that year. In the most lopsided championship game in AFL history, Lincoln and Lowe combined for over 400 yards of offense in a performance that stirred a different debate. I would have loved to see the Chicago Bears in 1963. The Chicago Bears. Hang out in front to beat the Giants for the NFL championship. Their great defense against the San Diego Chargers with that high-powered offense. I'm not so sure if the Chargers wouldn't have beaten them uh, if they played them straight up. That's how good Lowe and Lincoln were. 
think people look at the numbers that Lincoln and Lowe put up and say, ah, that was just old AFL. That's a good football team, and it doesn't compare with the National Football League teams. I think that you're not giving these two guys enough credit. They were outstanding players, and I believe they would have been outstanding players in any backfield, in any offense, in any league, at any time. Coming up on Top 10 Backfield Tandems, which of these two runners both have ties to the military? Find out next. Before we continue our countdown of the Top 10 Backfield Tandems, let's review our list. Number 10, Viner and Mac. Blue collar backs for a blue collar top. The classic lunch pail combo. Number nine, Boozer and Snell were a guarantee to make this list. He's in there, Those two guys were just quiet, steady workers. Number eight, Craig and Rathman, corn husker connection turned San Francisco treats. They're gonna name a city after him in the state of Nebraska. Number seven, Zonka and Morris make a perfect match in Miami. The speed and the power united to form the ultimate ground-gaining weapon. Number six, Lincoln and Lowe bolt the Chargers to a championship. These two guys just played off each other absolutely beautifully. And now, the number five backfield tandem of all time, Lenny Moore and Alan Amici. Well, you have uh, the workhorse and you have the halfback flanker. Alan Amici on a beautiful draw play, smashing 15 yards. Your classic Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside type of a backfield. They're off and running with lightning money more supplying the legwork. Our number five tandem came together because the Colts decided having two franchise backs was better than one. Alan Amici and Lenny Moore were back-to-back -back rookies of the year. In the 1955 draft meeting, among the cold draft choices were All-American Alan Amici of Wisconsin. In the next year, the draft comes around. One of the Colts coaches called Penn State and talked to Joe Paterno, who was then an assistant. Come on, take off now. Let's go. And said, what about Lenny Moore? Paterno said, if you have a chance to draft this guy and you don't, you'll regret it. One of the most exciting players to ever wear a cold uniform, Lenny Moore from Penn State. Lenny Moore had just such swiftness and grace and the ability to find the open space. Every time Lenny Moore was given the ball, it was the beginning of a unique adventure, a classic in cleats. He was so smooth, he could lay his feet down and walk on eggs without breaking them. Hold it right there and notice, ladies and gentlemen, his feet never touched the ground. When Lenny's feet did touch the ground, they were usually planted in pay dirt. Moore set an NFL record by scoring a touchdown in 18 consecutive games, a mark he still shares to this day. He's the only player in league history to have more than 40 rushing touchdowns and 40 receiving touchdowns. Moore scored over 100 touchdowns in his career, but he did not score the most famous touchdown in Colts history. You ask most people uh, who know anything about pro football about Alan Amici, and one image comes to mind. United States begins to Amici in the ball game. Alan Amici was faster than people realize. His first carry in the National Football League as a rookie, he went 79 yards for a touchdown against the Bears. Alan the Horse Amici broke in with the Colts in 1955, and how the horse broke in. When Lenny Moore came into the offense, Alan, being the selfless team guy that he was, he sort of adapted a new role. He became a little bit more of a power guy. He became more of a blocker. They were truly team first guys. If you think of a, a Terrell Owens mindset, I love me, love me. That's what those two didn't have. The number four backfield tandem of all time, Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer. Four. People talk about how the Steelers are one of the few teams in the NFL today that still have a true commitment to the run. Well, back then, a lot of teams had a true commitment to the run, but the Steelers had a bigger one. The Steeler attack is based upon a strong performance from its running back. Franco was a glider. He had that, you know, full speed at two steps. Franco Harris. Reaction, acceleration, and speed. Rocky Blyer 
is a classic football overachiever. And surprisingly, most of the power supplied by halfback Rocky Blyer, number 20. Rocky had those short, choppy steps, deceptive speed. Blyer's fire is quickness. To the ball and through the hole in a flicker. Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer were a great tandem because Rocky Blyer did not have a big ego. At first, number 20's main role was designated blocker for Franco Harris. I didn't want to be Franco. I was like a third guard. I mean, my role was that of a blocking back. The contribution Blyer has made is immeasurable. The peculiarity there is Franco was the big guy. Rocky Blyer was much smaller. Franco was a big man that really didn't play like a big man. He played like a halfback. Envision the power of a big back blended with the open field agility of a smaller man. Physically, Franco won out over his backfield partner. But it's quite hard to question the heart of Rocky Blyer. Rocky Blyer went to Vietnam, took some shrapnel. His foot was severely damaged. They told him he would never play football again. Uh, he defied all the odds makers and uh, he actually, much to his credit, came back from the war faster after he did all his rehab. Rocky breaks the tackle, comes over the right side, the 10, the 5, touchdown! Rocky was admired so much by fans and teammates. They had to be inspired saying, hey, if he can do what he's doing, my little pain in my knee, that'll go away soon if I just keep playing. All year, Blyer demonstrated how far heart and determination can take a man. Blyer's backfield partner may not have been a war hero, but he did have his own army. Franco's Italian army had that special Myron Coke flair. They came to the football games wearing battle helmets, carrying a huge Italian flag, and they called themselves Franco's Italian Army. Fan clubs popped up everywhere in Pittsburgh. Even the other half of our number four backfield tandem had one. We think. I covered those teams. I never heard of Rocky's flying squirrels. I mean, Franco's Italian Army is probably more well-known than a real Italian Army and certainly had more success. But Rocky's Flying Squirrels? Never heard of it. Fan clubs aside, the effectiveness of our number four backfield tandem was undeniable. The Steelers got 100-yard performances from running backs Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris. The results are the results. And certainly each back gaining 1,000 yards in a single season is absolutely amazing. Add in a Purple Heart, an immaculate reception, and four Super Bowl rings, it's only fitting for Franco and Rocky to rank fourth on our list. Big money game, baby! It's all about the money as we climb higher on our countdown. It's all about that for the cash! Tandems and their nicknames made a comeback in 2008. The crunch and munch combo of D'Angelo Williams and Jonathan Stewart carried Carolina to the NFC South title. Lindale White and Chris Johnson smashed and dashed the Titans to the best record in football. One, two, three, AKB! The Giants, Brandon Jacobs and Derek Ward each rushed for 1,000 yards. They're physically imposing their will. But it was the addition of Ahmad Bradshaw that made Earth, Wind and Fire feel the love. We're a team. We love each other. And while these new age nicknames are sweet, it's an old school 49ers quartet that had the richest name on our countdown. The number three backfield tandem of all time, the Million Dollar Backfield. The Million Dollar Backfield is one of the great stories in pro football. This is the fabled Million Dollar Backfield. Number 39, Hugh the King McElhenney. Number 34, Joe the Jet Perry. Number 14, YA the Bald Eagle Tittle. And number 35, John Henry Johnson. It's the only full house backfield that all four members are in the Hall of Fame. It's like having uh, Barry Sanders and uh, Earl Campbell and maybe John Riggins in the same backfield with John Elway. In the early 50s, a fledgling 49ers franchise tipped their hand and went for broke with a full house backfield. 
You have a great quarterback, obviously, in Tittle. With a name like Y.A. Tittle going for you, there would seem to be no need for further identification. You have a tremendous acceleration through the tackles, breakaway runner. Joe the Jet Furry displays the running form that established him as the best ball carrier in the league as he completes a 55-yard touchdown gallop. You have one of the best blocking fullbacks the NFL has ever seen. John Henry Johnson, the 45, cuts back at the 40. And then you have this one-of-a-kind, broken-field magician. Hugh McElhenney bursts through the line line and streaks downfield. The biggest problem I have as a quarterback is trying to figure out how to keep all three of these guys happy. John Henry was the toughest of the group. At the 35, spins away. He's to the 30, spinning like a whirling dervish, John Henry Johnson. If he had been a prize fighter, he'd be the heavyweight champion of the world. Johnson powers his way for 14 yards into the Detroit territory. I would used to say, John, take it easy because, you know, they're going to they're gonna get to me and take it out on me. Joe the Jet Ferry was so quick off the line, Tittle's toughest job was executing the exchange. Joe the Jet Ferry. Nine out of ten times, he could never get around fast enough to get me the ball. He's going to run right away from these Los Angeles Rams. The 49ers score again. Even in a backfield worthy of royalty, there can be only one king. Hugh uh, McElhaney was nicknamed the king before Elvis Presley was. Hugh the King McElhaney. To San Francisco 49er fans, the name was enough to create excitement. Hugh McElhaney was the Barry Sanders of his day. Watch him on this play as he goes around left end and leads his way for 42 yards. He'd get the ball in the open field and there was just no telling where he was going to go with it. McElhenney is one of the great runners in pro football and he proves it right here as he takes Tittle's short pass and he loses line after line. He'd go all the way over to this side of the field and then he'd cut back to that side of the field. The West Coast version of Hurricane Hazel breaks loose. It's Hurricane U McElhenney of the 49ers cutting a pass for 34 yards. Well, a million-dollar backfield of today's game would probably sound like a couple of backups. You're taking big money there, aren't you? Did the 49ers make millionaires out of the million-dollar backfield? Their combined salaries were not a million dollars. Their combined salaries, I doubt, were really $100,000. It was a name that was given to them because a sports writer on San Francisco said, these guys are like a million dollars. Up next... How did the Elmira Express derail one of football's most dynamic duos? Knowing how good both players were, certainly they could have been the number one tandem in the history of the National Football League. Jim, were you the greatest? I have to be number one. Jim Brown is widely considered to be the greatest running back of all time. Shining in the big man's shadow wasn't exactly easy. Lou Carpenter had a big day. Carpenter, Tommy Wilson, and number 36, Charlie Scales, each competed for the role of Robin to Jim Brown's Batman, but their attempts were a bust. Jim Brown and Leroy Kelly could have been a dynamic duo, but Brown bolted before they could blossom. Jim Brown retired. Leroy took his place and became a star. However, there was one halfback who joined forces with the game's greatest fullback for four years, helping forge the next tandem on our list. The number two backfield tandem of all time, Jim Brown and Bobby Mitchell. Welcome to another Cleveland Browns football show. Jim Brown and Bobby Mitchell, I mean, it's almost a dream come true for any coach uh, on any team. How is your backfield not going to be better, you know, with Jim Brown? Jim Brown is powerful as well as fast. He had everything. I mean, he had power. You didn't see nobody knock him down. Look at the film. Jim runs over a lot of players, spins out of their arms to go 23 yards to a touchdown. Well, you almost forget about Bobby Mitchell because it was Jim Brown. But Bobby Mitchell was a heck of a football player. Touchdowns come fast when you have a fellow like Bobby Mitchell in your backfield. Bobby was sort of like filet mignon to Jim Brown's sirloin. Bobby was just served up in, in smaller portions, but uh, they were always very tasty. And Mitchell Speed gets another six points for Cleveland. It's hard to view Jim as being part of a backfield tandem, but let's look at Mitchell and what he did in his career. He was actually not a high draft pick. The thinking was that Bobby Mitchell was going to stay in track. 
He was a Big Ten sprint champion, hurdles champion. He had very sort of loose ankles, almost floppy. Mitchell shows some of his hurdling ability gained as a college track man. When he came to training camp, Jim Brown would challenge Bobby Mitchell to sprints. And Jim Brown was running stride for stride with Bobby Mitchell and sometimes beating. It was the first time it really opened people's eyes to how fast Jim Brown was. He's a big man, but he can move like lightning. Our number two backfield tandem may have taken part in some friendly competition at practice, but Paul Brown was clever enough to keep it going on game day. He would come to me just before the kickoff and would say, Bobby, I want you to take this kickoff, get it out there, get it out there, and get the big man going. And Mitchell is off on a 91-yard touchdown sprint. He would use me to push Jim. The spotlight camera focuses on Jim Brown as Cleveland's ground game comes alive. Once Mitchell got Brown going, nothing could stop Cleveland's dynamic duo. And another fancy run by Speedy Bobby. Our number two tandem turned out over five yards per carry during their four years together. Surprisingly, NFL titles eluded the Ohio twosome, forcing Paul Brown to ponder a change. At the end of the 61 season, Paul Brown traded Bobby Mitchell to the Redskins for the rights to Ernie Davis. These newsreel clips of Ernie in action show you why. Unfortunately, he came down with cancer and never played it down in the NFL. I wish that Mitchell and Jim Brown could have played longer together, but the Browns thought they could even get better. Davis in the same backfield with a great Jim Brown. Wow. That may have been very special, but what they had before was pretty special, too. You had Bobby Mitchell with his pure speed, and you had Jim Brown who really had everything going for his running game. I would have loved to see that tandem stay together for a lot longer. Coming up, we reveal our number one backfield tandem. What was their number one play? Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. It's the play we must make go. Find out next. Before we reveal our number one backfield tandem of all time, let's review our list. Number 10, Biner and Mack rattle and roll to 1,000. Mack and Biner, two north-south runners. They're punishing. Number 9, Boozer and Snell bring a ground game to Gang Green. And Snell goes straight for a touchdown. Number 8, Craig and Rathman, the back-to-back -back backfield. Seeing those guys win a couple of Super Bowls, I would think would get them a little higher on the list. Number 7, Zonka and Morris keep defenses in doubt. You had somebody who could fake you out and somebody who could knock you over, and you didn't know which one was coming at you at any time. Number six, Lincoln and Lowe, the AFL combo with NFL Fred. They would have been outstanding players in any backfield. Number five, Moore and Amici give Baltimore plenty of horsepower. Classic Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside type of a backfield. Number four, Franco and Rocky deliver a quartet of titles. The Pittsburgh Steelers are the champions for the fourth time. Number three, the 49ers do not show the million dollar backfield the money. None of those guys ever came close to seeing a million dollars. Number two, Brown and Mitchell did everything except win a title. Jim Brown only won one NFL championship, and that was after Bobby Mitchell had left. Horning and Taylor will win out because they won championships. And now, the number one backfield tandem of all time, Paul Horning and Jim Taylor. In our business, there is no second place. Either you're first or you're last. Paul Horning and Jim Taylor, they got to be the number one tandem of all time. Mm. They were a great tent. You know, you had lightning and thunder. Uh, when we talk about lightning and Paul Horning, he was lightning in so many ways. The almost unstoppable Horning, which is a press for the touchdown. In terms of his all-around skill, you haven't seen many players like Horning as a running back, as a tremendous kicker, uh, and a guy who could throw the halfback pass. Horning won his famous pass option play. He was as effective as any one human being could be on a football field. He could do everything. Every play with Jim Taylor was an examination of his manhood. He hit the line with, with splintering force. Taylor goes ramming through the middle for the first touchdown of the game. 
He didn't try to go by anybody. He didn't try to finesse anybody. He tried to injure every tackle. He is a reminder that football is still a game for men who love violence. I would say that the number one play in our offensive category is the is the power sweep. The power sweep. Jim Taylor would unselfishly be out there just as effectively blocking for Horning and Horning just as effectively for Taylor. Horning throws a beautiful crossbody block on Ernie Clark. Jim opens the throttle and Taylor tallies. I've always took a lot of pride in my blocking. Blocking was very important as far as Lombardi was concerned. What we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here. The old video of Vince Lombardi, we're going to make an alley, we're going to run here, here, right down the alley. And try to run this play in the alley. Vince Lombardi said if we can establish the Green Bay Packers sweep, then teams will respect us and we're going to be a good football team. The Packers, they perfected it. It helped them achieve the success they did throughout the 60s. And the Packers have just taken the championship. Paul Horning and Jim Taylor swept their way through the 60s, winning four NFL titles along with the first ever Super Bowl. And the Chiefs down to the Packers 35 to 10. A super debut for the Super Bowl. While they had successful careers in common, our number one backfield tandem was really a bit of an odd couple. Taylor was, you know, your classic play with a bloody nose and knock you over kind of guy. I'm going to punish him. I'm going to hit the tackler hard and then he's going to hit me. And Horning was the golden boy, Heisman Trophy winner, Notre Dame. I came from Notre Dame with a few awards and I came to Green Bay with a lot of publicity. Jim Taylor was in the weight room pumping iron. Paul Horning was out nights pumping something else. Horning was the playboy. Horning was always the one who got in trouble. He certainly had very strong leadership qualities off the football field. <laughs> Come on, Rick, quit laughing. Huh? <laughs> quit laughing. The bonds that he brought in. If you're bad on the field and you'd be bad off the field with the chicks, all right? He did love to score, both on the field and off, I guess. <laughs> Vince always said that I did a pretty good job when I got close to the goal line. When Horning is in there, he smells the goal line. Horning used to joke that it was Jim Taylor's job to get the Packers inside the 10-yard line. But once they got there, Horning would say to Taylor, okay, Jim, don't go in there and score. That's my job. Ball pushes a press for the touchdown. Horning and I, we had the camaraderie of the, of the football team at heart. No one was bigger than, than the team. Every man must be committed to excellence. Every man must be committed to victory. Taylor and Horning teamed up for 150 touchdowns in Titletown before heading to their permanent home in Kenton. Thank you very much. This pair of Packers had everything. Power, precision, and playoff success. Now they have our top honor as the best backfield tandem of all time. When you look at what they accomplished and how well they played together, I would absolutely pick them as the greatest backfield pairing of all time. There you have it, our top 10 backfield tandems of all time. You may be wondering why you didn't see many pairings from the past 20 years. It may be because the era of the terrific twosome has all but eroded. The problem with ranking tandems is what era in which they played. Back in the day, you ran split backs, guys that can do a little bit of everything. This is what makes the partnership so successful. In today's world, teams don't run that kind of offense. Those positions have evolved into pretty much one player with the other player being the blocking guy. So the next time you're rooting for your favorite running back, show a little passion for his partner, and perhaps we'll have a new backfield tandem for our next list.